surely do what Simon say And if you like to see me smile Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with veteran Milwaukee-based jazz vocalist Marcia Danielle. Her career embodies the rich tradition and vibrant innovation of jazz music. With her eclectic background and extensive performance history, her journey in jazz is a testament to the genre's enduring appeal and continual evolution. Born in Germany and seasoned in vibrant cultural centers like England, Italy, and New York City, her music blends traditional jazz standards with influences from Motown and beyond, offering a contemporary twist on classic sounds. It's an ongoing narrative of jazz filled with passion, innovation, and a deep respect for its roots. Enjoy this story. It's great to meet you. Where are you located? I'm in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Okay, good, 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 good. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm in Kansas City. We're kind of in the same neighborhood, so to speak. Sure. uh, But it's great to meet you. I'm looking forward to getting into keeping it simple in your life and music. So thank you for taking a minute out. Okay, I appreciate the opportunity. So before we get into the album, I want to begin with the one thing that really kind of threw threw a loop for everybody, but especially musicians, which was living through this pandemic. And four years ago, we were trying to figure mm-hmm. out how we were going to get out of it, how it was going to affect mm-hmm. us. How did you mm-hmm. ultimately make it through that COVID time period? And how did it either influence this album or the way that you do things now as a musician? Well, the, uh, kind of answering the, the last question first, this album is actually, the album is not new. The album was recorded many years ago now, um, in 29, I think, 2009. I uh, did like kind of like the first rendition of it, and then uh, in 2010 did the one which I think most people um, who are familiar with me are familiar with. So the album was actually done way before covid um, but now to the first question of how, you know, did I survive through COVID? I guess, quite honestly, it was due to, um, well, you know, initially I was still, let's see, I, still teaching? I was teaching um, and I taught online. I did sessions and consultations and things like that online um, pretty much as soon as we were able to or allowed, you know, to resume certain in-person activities within our state, um, I returned to my, you know, my brick and mortar teaching positions with, you know, serious modifications. Um, it seems like such a long time ago, um, but I remember <laughs> at one point I had a plexiglass uh, you know, a piece of plexiglass, a pretty large one that I would cart around, you know, from studio to studio to do my teaching sessions and all different kinds of masks from the homemade masks, uh, you know, that other people made and were selling to, um, you know, the various, the variety of, uh, varieties of other masks that were sold on Amazon and in the stores. Um, yeah, so that was kind of crazy and it really kind of seems like a blur to me because while clearly, you know, I was not performing in person, I, I didn't really have, um, I didn't really have a, a bad time. You know, I, I was doing so much stuff, so much, uh, work and teaching online that it almost seemed like, you know, like the time passed pretty quickly for me. And then shortly after, like I said, shortly after we were able to uh, resume certain in-person activities, um, shortly after that, the performance opportunities started, uh, you know, to come back in, of course, with modifications, you know, according to what it was that um, we knew about COVID at that time and, you know, how to mitigate the situation. Of course, things are, are much, much different now, but um, I am, I'm blessed, I guess, to be able to say that I, I feel like I survived COVID without everything in my life being dismantled, you know, um, 
course, there wasn't the same volume of work. And like I said, you know, like everybody else, I pivoted and started doing more online stuff. And for, for myself, I'll say more because I'd always, uh, for years now, I'd been doing some version of um, of online lessons, you know, online teaching. Um, and let's see, other projects came up with one of my, with one of the institutions, one of the organizations that I'm involved with. There were, they got very creative in terms of creating opportunities for our faculty to still be able to work. So, um, I recall that, let's see, Milwaukee Public Schools you know, went into an online remote mode, and we were actually still able to uh, retain, you know, a lot of that work remotely. So the school or schools that I would have normally been seeing during the court, physically during the course of a week, um, I saw them um, online. And that was one really creative thing that, that I think my employers did. Another thing they did was, um, again, it was, you know, online, but they provided employment opportunities for us to actually create online content that they would then make available to their clients. So um, I guess I was just really blessed in kind of having the right professional, you know, affiliation at a very bad time, you know, in our history. So um, I almost didn't miss a beat, no pun intended. Yeah, yeah, no, I get it. So let's go to the beginnings of your life. Tell me where you were born and raised, and how did the seeds of music and more specifically jazz evolve into your life as we know it now? Well, I was born in Germany. My father was in the service. Um, didn't spend, you know, much time over there. So probably we were there maybe, just, or I was there rather, just under a year. Um, then came back home and home, the home area for me was the south suburbs of Chicago. So pretty much my uh, entire family, both on my mom and my dad's side, uh, lived just south of Chicago with some people, of course, you know, actually in the city. Um, I do come from a very musical family uh, and a, a family of definitely of people who appreciate music. So, you know, my mom is a singer. Uh, my dad played jazz piano. Um, my mom's father was a, a, I guess you'd call him kind of a weekend warrior, um, my mother's family is from West Virginia, and, uh, you know, so they're mountain folk. And um, my granddad played country western music <laughs> on the weekends. He was a guitar player, and he had, you know, of course, a regular electric guitar, and then he also had a steel guitar. And as I understand it, in earlier years, uh, he also, you know, picked a little bit with the banjo. So that's kind of all that on one side. And my mom sang, you know, gospel music. She sang in the church. And then uh, in later years, she got involved in, you know, community choirs, which kind of expanded her repertoire a bit from um, gospel to, you know, be more inclusive, like of classical music. Uh, and as I mentioned before, my dad was a jazz piano player and always played. We always had a piano. Um, in our home, my parents both grew up, uh, you know, with pianos in the home. Um, my dad's father was a singer. His father was a singer. So uh, my aunt was a so lots and lots and lots of music. Um, my dad's youngest brother was, uh, was a horn player. He played flugelhorn. And he went on to, um, he's now a, a doctor, Dr. McReynolds. Uh, he re went on to get his doctorate in music uh, from the University of Iowa, and he still lives in, and works in Iowa. So um, I was exposed to a lot of different music. Um, nothing was ever forced upon me. It was not 
the requirement, you know, that I take private lessons. Uh, it was something that I was interested in, and I was fortunate enough to grow up in an environment where artistic uh, expression and um, artistic musical exploration was, um, you know, was cool. You know, that was something that was going to be supported. Um, so, and as I'm thinking, as I'm talking to you, uh, many of my cousins, you know, who are not, some of whom... Um, are most of whom are not uh, professional musicians, but like pretty much all of us had the opportunity to study music as we were coming along. Um, my first professional forays into music, however, were not with jazz, although I always liked jazz. Um, it was with classical music. And um, so that's what I did when I first started working as a singer, which was... Uh, I was about 15, um, was performing classical music. Uh, my choir director at high school, at my high school, started hiring me to do like weddings, you know, for um, parishioners at the ch at his church. And then, you know, things kind of went from there. I could, I started taking private lessons, um, and then kind of speeding ahead, speeding over some things, went to college, um, studied music, you know, of course, studied more voice performance in college. It was all uh, classical music, though. Um, the diction, the techniques, the repertoire, you know, everything was classical. And I played piano. I started playing piano when I was seven, and I continued that all the way through college as well. Uh, so jazz for me specifically um, came, I don't want to say later in my career because that would imply that I'm old, which I'm not old, uh, but jazz came with a transition, I think, that I, that organically happened for me um, as the result of different people, you know, my parents and a friend or two um, when I was in Iowa City at the University of Iowa saying, hey, you know, have you ever thought about singing jazz? You know, it seems like there are things, you know, qualities in your voice that could lend themselves, lend themselves very well or very easily to jazz. And so I started, um, a buddy of mine in Iowa City gave me like a, my first small little vocal, real book, so to speak. And it's like, here, just, you know, start learning tunes. And um, I had always, what most people don't know about me is that in spite of my current, um, you know, jazz life and my former classical life, what I really, really listened to the most when I wasn't, um, and still even to this day, was a, a lot of, like, 70s funk, R&B, um, I'm a huge, huge, huge fan of <laughs> disco music, um, funk music, classic R&B, uh, so definitely music from the, the 70s um, and early 80s. So that's, you know, when I got done learning, like my arias, for example, when I was in, in when I was an undergrad, um, I was listening to, you know, everything else, you know, and especially being from the Chicago area, um, I took took to the style of Chicago house music, you know, during its heyday in the 80s. Um, and so, you know, kind of jumping back into the, the jazz pot here, um, what I started to, re what I began to realize was that when singing jazz, you know, whether it was standards, whether, uh, you know, typical American or traditional, rather, American standards or, um, you know, like that, Brazilian jazz, uh, I began to experience a level of artistic freedom and just an innate and immediate and innate and an immediate 
uh, kind of heart connection to the way that I was able to use my voice. Um, of course, you know, we know that jazz also is a structured music. It has a structure. Um, there are, you know, to a certain extent, there are certain expectations, you know, within the idiom. It, it's, you know, there's a language. Um, that was not the language of music that I, uh, it was not a language that I found my way to through academia. So coming out of, coming from, you know, a very um, regimented um, form of yet still expressive style of music, you know, singing classical music, and then moving into this genre where um, I don't want to say anything goes, but where what I want to do or want to bring to it, I think, as an artist, um, was more uh, accepted. You know, it was more acceptable. Um, I found that I was, I felt less, I guess, judged. You know, um, I felt like a lot of the pressure uh, that you experience in pursuing a career, a career as a classical vocalist was kind of taken away because I, I didn't intellectually, I didn't feel that I needed to spend so much time, you know, kind of like comparing myself to the quote unquote status quo of the genre, you know, the, the um, those who were out currently doing things and doing it in a particular kind of way. So I guess, you know, long story not getting longer, um, what I experienced in, in jazz and what attracted me to it and has kept me involved in it uh, is, is freedom, the freedom to express, uh, the freedom to explore, um, different colors in my voice, uh, different ideas, the the type of freedom and interaction that as a jazz vocalist I, that I'm allowed to have with the musicians, you know, with whom I'm working. Those are things that um, perhaps I guess you could experience that in classical music uh, in you know, in concertizing, you know, so if you're doing, say, solo recitals, just you and a pianist, there absolutely is um, a connection and a synthesis um, that the two of you have to have when working with each other, and um, hopefully if you're working with a good, um, a good accompanist um, or collaborative pianist, really, I think is more appropriate there's a desire from the musician to really tune into what's going on, you know, with you and and be able to support that in a very expressive way. Um, so it's not that I'm saying that I, I don't feel that classical music is expressive, because certainly it is. You know, that would be a, a false statement, and that's not how I feel. But I think the way that my musical being wanted to be able to express itself was not being fully met by only singing classical music. Um, so then um, pretty much after Iowa, uh, I guess the next chapter would kind of be like the New York chapter. And um, in New York, uh, I did a lot of background vocals, so I I did a lot of session work, not for anybody famous, but just, you know, for working stiff, uh, <laughs> such as myself. So I, I hustled a lot of studio gigs, uh, did a lot of background vocal singing. I taught, so I had a pretty good-sized um, teaching studio, a variety of singers, everybody from those pursuing careers on Broadway to heavy metal to classic rock, gospel, um, 
and inspirational music in general. So um, that is kind of what happened in New York, along with me meeting a fellow named Bert Eckhoff, who was a jazz pianist, um, and I met him through an ad on Craigslist. You know, he was looking, basically looking for singers to just kind of get together with and, you know, keep his his chops up and, um, you know, and just run tunes. And I happened to see his ad. I responded to it. And uh, I'd say he probably became like my first, quote, unquote, formal uh, jazz mentor. Um, He heard certain things in my voice and was really excited, you know, and thought, oh, you, you know, you seem to have a natural sense of swing and blah, blah, blah. And so, he, you know, he taught me how to listen to um, to recordings, how to kind of develop my own next level listening experience, you know, um, helping me, I guess, move from listening with, you know, in hopes of being able to maybe imitate certain things to being able to just be learning how to be informed by what I was hearing, not only from the singers on the recording, but from the musicians who were working with those singers. Uh, So, you know, with him, um, I listened a lot to, let's say, like, Etta Jones, Carmen McRae, Dakota Satin, um, women who were definitely jazz singers, but, you know, certainly had a a very present and noticeable um, sense of soul, you know, in what what they did. And uh, so it was with Bert uh, and, and under his tutelage that I first started to kind of formulate what would become like my initial uh, songbook, if you will. Um, And then, uh, you know, I palled around with other jazz musicians in the city. You know, you're in New York, some of the best musicians in the world, um, especially jazz musicians, uh, take up, you know, have digs in New York. So it was a great place to just be able to access the scene and, um, you know, become a part of, um, you know, take part rather in just that whole, you know, listening experience. Um, And like I said, because I I was a little older, so I I was not of college age uh, when I was in New York. I was in my 30s. In fact, I guess I was comfortably in my 30s. And as I also, you know, as I mentioned before, I I was not on the academic jazz track. So I was one of those folks who was definitely, I was a singer who was definitely interested in gleaning as much information as I could uh, from the scene socially, musically. Um, I met a lot of older cats who, you know, just kind of on the scene, you know, uh, bump into folks and they're, you know, were more than willing to chit chat, um, about their life experiences. I had an opportunity to work with, uh, two different bass players who performed with, uh, regularly with some of the greatest, uh, female singers in jazz. Uh, they worked with Nina Simone, um, Betty Carter, Gloria Lynn, uh, you know, just a long list of, of Dakota Satin a long list of fantastic singers. And so each one of those conversations and and experiences um, I've added to, you know, who I was developing into, I think, as a, as a jazz singer. Um, and uh, so I guess the first, you know, my CD, Keeping It Simple, which now I guess is an older CD, Vintage, I'll call it a vintage project. Um, That's how I chose the music, you know, that's why I chose that music. Um, And I chose a very simple format 
uh, because it was something that was new to me, and I didn't want to, you know, get in over my head, um, you know, try to do a lot of things uh, with that recording that maybe I wasn't quite ready to do. Uh, so I just decided, you know, hey, I'm going to keep it simple. I'm going to keep my song choices simple. I'm going to keep the uh, the arrangements and or the, the band format very simple. And um, that's how we came up with, with the album. That's wonderful. You've done a really good job of kind of weaving and orchestrating a lot of uh, narrative that I wanted to kind of follow up on. So ultimately oh, okay. at the end of the... Yeah, so you did great. You really kind of filled in a lot of spaces. So if um, if anyone wants to pick up the album, they want to see you live, anything more about your world, where can they go? They can go to com, and I'll spell my name, M-A-R-C-Y-A-D-A-N-E-I-L-L-E.com. Uh, you can find... Um, you know, my, you can find my music there. You can read my bio. You can uh, check out my my um, performance so itinerary, uh, and you can shoot me a note. You know, if you if you have something nice that you'd like to say, hopefully only nice nice inquiries or booking inquiries. Those can, of course, will be made um, via my website. Okay, excellent. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much for taking a minute out to talk about your career, the album that's going on. Best of luck with everything. Okay, thanks so much, Joe. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players and singers in Chicago, Milwaukee, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. If you want to hear more Neon Jazz interviews, you can find us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Subscribe to us at YouTube, and for everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.